Hey friends, and welcome back to Deep Dive, the podcast where I have the immense pleasure of sitting down with authors and experts and entrepreneurs and other inspiring people so that we can learn from them to help build lives that we love. Today, we have got a very special episode. We're gonna be hearing from a group of relationship experts about how you can find love and build healthy relationships. So whether you're totally new to the world of dating or you're looking to strengthen a long-term existing relationship, this episode is a bit of a rundown from some of the world's leading experts about everything you need to know. First up, we have Matthew Hussey and Dr. Logan Yuri. Matthew is a super popular dating coach who has loads of experience in helping people find love. And Dr. Logan is a behavioral scientist and the author of the fantastic book, How to Not Die Alone. They're going to share their tips and tricks for successful dates. And they'll explain why attraction is not the only thing you need to consider when looking for a partner. Then doctors John and Julie Gottman and Hannah Witten will talk about making sure your relationship is as happy as possible. The Gottmans are world-renowned relationship experts who've studied the science of long-term relationships. And Hannah Witten is a content creator who specializes in sex education. They're here with practical advice on how to handle disagreements and suggestions about how to run a relationship review system, which is what I do with my partner, to make sure that you and your partner are on the right track. And finally, Francesca Spector, author of the book Alonement, will explain why it's still super important to have alone time and take care of yourself when you're in a relationship. So let's get into it. I talk about the um there being a kind of a, a formula and i don't mean this crudely i i just mean there are certain components to deep and lasting attraction you have chemistry um perceived value perceived challenge and connection the reason i like this model is because when you look at this, you can usually see, you can sort of self-diagnose where something may be going wrong. Chemistry is interesting because there's certain, there's a certain intangible there and an unknown there and not, we certainly can't control all of it, but we can control some of it, you know, with the way, the way that we look, how well we take care of ourselves, the way we move importantly is a big factor in chemistry um which is why you can sometimes see someone in photos and think they're really attractive and then you meet them in real life and you kind of go oh weird mm. <laughs> i don't feel the same way it's also why you can get back from a date and and say oh my god i just had the, this amazing date with this incredibly hot person and if you show pictures of that person to your friends they're like okay yeah <laughs> <laughs> i guess you know because you you were there. Yeah. You were there. You saw how they move, how they smile, how they, how they gesture, how they their micro expressions. So there's certainly things we can do to affect chemistry. Uh, and obviously you can create tension too, which is a big factor in chemistry in chemistry. Then there's perceived value. And perceived value is all these things that that we are and do that bring value to the table. Uh, it might be our personality, uh, it might be the things that we're good at in life, it might be our life the life that we've built um, can sometimes be our friends and family. You know, sometimes you meet someone's friends and family and you go, whoa, this is what a life this is to come into. They have an amazing group of people around them, so much love, so much. So there's a lot of ways for perceived value to, to manifest itself. Then there's perceived challenge. And the interesting thing about perceived value is it goes down regardless of how many things are in that category if there's no perceived challenge hmm. and perceived challenge is not, uh, the kind of, I don't know, a typical way of thinking about it, I guess would be like hard to get. Yeah. It's not, that's a cheap way to create challenge because the problem with hard to get is you can't keep it up forever. The moment you are got, yeah. if someone's, if your attraction was built around the getting, hmm. then you can't sustain it. But if the, the, the real beautiful, sustainable way to create challenge is for there to be, uh, for your value to have a price. Okay. What do you mean? That, that your value doesn't come for free. Your value is something that has to be earned by the, someone showing up in the way you're prepared to show up by someone being prepared to make the kind of sacrifices you're prepared to make for someone, um, by someone giving to you on a level that you're willing to give, respecting you on a level that, that you respect them. Um, and also not giving someone too much credit too quickly. That's a, 
a big problem. When we come from a needy place, when we come from a place of insecurity, we start giving people credit they don't deserve yet. I just met them. I just had the most amazing date with the most amazing person. Oh my God, they're incredible. Based on what? Based on how, for, on what basis, what information could you have possibly got on one date that enables you to say this? You have been seduced by a kind of charm, a charisma maybe, a, the fact that you did something really fun on the date, the fact that they made you laugh a lot, the fact that they told stories about their past that made them relatable or sympathetic or seem really authentic. All of that is great. I'm not, be, I'm not saying be inherently suspicious. I'm saying you don't know. Yeah. You don't know. So on what basis are you giving them all of this value already based on projection and based on insecurity, this immediate putting them on a pedestal and putting yourself down here. And when someone smells that, mm. they don't see an equal anymore. And that's, that's what I mean when I say challenge. I don't mean artificially constructing games or hoops for people to jump through. I mean that the, the criteria you have for someone has to be real. Yeah. It has to be real. Like it's, you and I met today for the first time, really enjoying our conversation. Hope you are too. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, but we don't know each other yet as friends. You don't know if I'd be reliable if you needed something. You don't know if I would show up to support you if something went wrong in your life. You don't know, you don't know any of that. So, you know, it would be dangerous to go away and make a an assessment on how great of a friend I would be yeah. based on this exchange. It what what you would hope in an organic situation is that you and I go, this was really, really fun. We got on really well. This was a great conversation. I would like to get to know this guy mm. better. That would be like it'd be really cool if we could hang out outside of the podcast. But it's not I have to be friends with with Ali, you know, like we have, I have to, because he's a, he's an amazing guy, you know, like yeah. that's that now that's projection. That's dangerous because I'm basing that on the fact that you're clearly outwardly a very impressive human and what you've achieved, what you've done is very impressive. And you seem to have had a really amazing kind of impact on a lot of people. And those are all amazing things. Those are amazing things in their own right. It's not about devaluing those, but I have no idea what your value would be as a friend mm. until we try being friends. Yep. And the mistake people make in dating commonly is they look at someone's stats. Yep. How charming were they? How charismatic were they? How successful are they? Um, you know, where are they in their life? What kind of person do they seem to be? But none of that exists in relation to, to you. That's all just you admiring what this person has or is. But none of it says this person's going to be a great boyfriend or a great girlfriend. None of it says they're going to be loyal. None of it says they're going to be reliable. None of it says they're going to be a great teammate. All it says is this person seems on these metrics to be attractive. And in any relationship, you have to go through four, for, in terms of importance, you have to go through four stages. One is admiration. <laughs> That's just where I can see someone and admire them from a, either up close or afar. Wow, this person's pretty impressive and attractive. Not very important. In the stages, not important. Yep. Necessary, but not important. Yep. Then there's a uh, uh, connection or chemistry. The, you, both you need you know th that's the next stage of do we feel connected to each other and is there a kind of chemistry mm. all right now it's slightly more important because now it becomes mutual yeah now it's not just me admiring you it's oh there's something between us yeah not important because necessary yeah but not important how many people have ruined their lives over the fact that they had chemistry with someone 
even when that person was a terrible partner, a terrible person to base their, their decisions on. The next stage is a commitment. Okay, I admire you. We have mutual chemistry and connection, and we're both actually saying yes to each other. Mm. I deal with people every day where they have this stage, yep. but that person isn't saying yes. They're saying, yeah, I, I'd like to see you this Friday at 11 o'clock, but they're not saying yes to an actual relationship. So you need commitment to go to the next stage of importance. But many people are treating something like it has total importance, even though they're only at the second stage. So you need a yes, you need commitment. Now, you would say if you've got that, that's the most important thing you can have. You've got someone you admire, you've got someone you have a connection with in chemistry, and you've got someone who is committed. It would seem like that was everything, but that kind of idea, is it Virgil, love conquers all? Love does not conquer all. Mm. Two people saying yes to each other doesn't, doesn't make for a long-term yeah. relationship. You also have to have the fourth stage of importance, which is compatibility. Yeah. Are you actually compatible? Because if you're not, you can say, yes, I want to be with you. Yes, I'm committed. But that lack of compatibility will show up in ways that will make both of you miserable. Well, what do you mean by compatibility? It could be anything. It could be uh, my idea of a good time is staying home, watching movies, and yours is constantly traveling around the world. Yeah. It could be your idea of a good time is going out and drinking and doing drugs, and I don't want to live that life. Yeah. And we've both said yes to each other, but the, you know our idea of what is a good life is completely different. Or our idea of loyalty is completely different. Your idea of loyalty is that I don't have sex with anyone. My idea of loyalty is that you don't emotionally cheat on me in the texts you send. Yeah. You know, that we've both said yes to each other. We have admiration, connection, com commitment. And yet I am miserable yeah. because of what your definition of loyalty is. So compatibility is, do we both want to live the same kind of life and, and do our values line up? And do we both have the same idea? Two people can say, I value kindness, but we can have very different standards for what kindness actually means. So without that stage, so many things go wrong. My, what, what I mean to say with all of this is that we lose our value in dating when we stop paying attention to the appropriate level of importance at different stages. If you take stage two, I found someone I have a connection with, as the be all end all and the thing that you martyr yourself in service of, you lose all your value. You, you are now the person who spends a lifetime uh, accepting really poor treatment from someone because every time you see them, it's amazing. You don't understand when we're together. It's so good. Yeah. It's so incredible. They're so there for me. The, the sex is amazing. The chemistry is amazing. We have such amazing conversations. What's the problem? I haven't heard from them in two weeks. But Matt, you don't understand. The connection is incredible. You don't understand. Like this, this is really important to me. Why? Why? Because you, you have miscalculated the value of stage two. Mm. And when you do that, you lose your value because someone realizes your value, what you're willing to give has no price. It's free. It does not need to be earned. So your perceived challenge drops. And when you're perceived, when there's no challenge to you, when someone realizes your value has no price, then you lose respect. One of the things you talk about in the book is the idea of um, prom date versus life partner. And if I kind of paraphrase, uh, there are different things that we're looking for in a prom date where maybe we're focused on how attractive are they and how adventurous and risky and interesting do they seem. Whereas there are different qualities that we look for in a life partner, which is more like I think, growth mindset, uh, emotional maturity, the ability to fight well and communicate clearly, etc. Um, how, when, when it comes to like first and second dates, how would you go about sussing out the more deeper qualities where uh, in in the context of a date where like everyone is kind of p 
putting on the best behavior you would you would think. Great. So yes, I love this concept. And I think that it's really important in people's personal development to make that shift from the prom date to the life partner. And unfortunately, some people just think, oh, that happens with time. But no, I think you really have to make a concerted effort to say like, yeah, that guy's really hot and it'd be fun to sleep with him. But he's actually not that reliable. I don't know if he'll show up when he says he will. I'm constantly worried about him letting me down. And actually what I'm experiencing isn't chemistry, it's anxiety. And so that's the prom date. And now I'm going to reject that person and move towards the life partner. And so for anyone listening or watching, I would say, if you consistently find yourself with prom dates, I want you to focus on the life partner. Mm. In terms of how to find these people early on, I think you can do it as early as the profile, the messaging, and first dates. And it's really about coming up with some questions that help you elicit certain responses. And so something about the growth mindset is people with a growth mindset feel like they can try new skills safely. And even if they're bad at them, that's totally fine because life is about getting better as opposed to somebody with a fixed mindset who says, you're born with these skills and you can't improve them. So a question I've been encouraging people to ask over the last two years while we've been in the pandemic is something like, what's something that you were bad at that you've gotten better at? Or have you invested any time, especially during lockdown in working on any skills? And you know, you can iterate that on that and make it sound more casual, but just understanding, is this the kind of person who says, I have a lot of alone time, I'm going to learn to speak Spanish? Or did they just spend more time playing video games, right? Like what is this person's orientation toward growth? In terms of loyalty, a really important quality you can ask these people, you know, do you have friends from different stages of your life or what is the best gift you've ever given? There's chances where you say, this is the quality in the person I'm looking for. This is the question that strategically helps me understand if they have that. And then I'm actually going to listen to their answer and see how it jives with me and not just say, well, actually, all their answers were terrible, but they're so hot. I'm going to ignore it. No, no, no. That's a prom date thing. Yeah. Listen to their answers and say, is this the kind of person that I want to keep getting to know? Or do I want to find someone who's more aligned with the qualities I'm looking for? Mm. Yeah. One of the one of the things that I, I accidentally did, this was before I read the book, is that um, on this uh, with with this girl who I'm I'm now like, I guess, in a relationship with well, that, feel, that still feels weird to say um, on, our, on our second date. Yay. We went to play Top Golf, which is like this cross between 10 pin bowling and a golf driver's driving range. And neither of us had ever played golf before. And so I messaged her being like, hey, do you want to try this golf thing? And she was like, I mean, I've never played golf before. I was like, me neither. Let's just give it a go. And she was totally up for it. And that was one of the things that really stood out where I was like, she was totally cool with actually trying out this new thing, being okay with looking like a bit of an idiot, playing both of us playing the sport that we never played before. Um, and so I really liked that as um, a thing. And then I read the growth mindset stuff in the book and I was like, oh, I kind of accidentally <laughs> kind of selected for that particular quality, which was kind of nice. I I love that story so much. I think there's so much to that. First of all, you were brave in suggesting something that you weren't good at. There might be somebody out there who says, oh, I only take people on dates to things I'm really good at so that I look good in a certain light. No, what you were showing is that you're fun and spontaneous and willing to try new things and be bad at them. And she was also willing to do that. So I think that's a great idea. I talked before about dating like a scientist. Part of dating like a scientist is having a hypothesis, testing it, and then looking at the data. And so a big thing that people have been asking me in the last year or so is I want to ask people if we can do a phone call or a video date before we meet up, but some people will be turned off by that. I think using what you said, um, hey, on a scale of uh, this is scary to I'm interested. How open are you to having a phone call or a video call? That could be a cool way of doing it. But I also think just asking and seeing how the person responds gives you a lot of data. So maybe somebody says a video call. What are you screening me for a job? That's weird. No. Or they say, I haven't done that before, but I'm open to it. And so it's each moment is a chance to see you're putting out um, some sort of stimulus and you're seeing how they're responding to it. And that gives you a lot of information. And so do the bold thing, ask the question and see if they can roll with it. Or are they so traditional and so tied to certain norms that that freaks them out? Well, if you don't like that, then that's maybe not the kind of person you want to be with. Nice. One of the things that you talk about is the sort of ref actively reflecting on a date when you get back from it. Um, and I wanted to ask like, to what extent, like, what are the sorts of questions that we should be asking when we get back from dates? And to what extent is, like, 
a sort of checklist approach to this a good idea? Because we talk about things like growth mindset and emotional maturity and ability to communicate. Is that the sort of thing, like, similar to how, like, if you're hiring someone for a job, you want to have, like, a scorecard and you want to be able to evaluate each candidate against the scorecard, is this the sort of person who would be able to do X? To what extent is that, like, a decent approach when it comes to dating and reflecting on dates afterwards? In general, I think that having a checklist is not helpful because often what's on that checklist is the wrong stuff. Mm -hmm. It's the height, income, perceived success, Do we have the same hobbies? I think a lot of times that checklist is based on what we think matters in long-term relationships, which the research shows us doesn't matter in long-term relationships. So as a concept, I would say, throw out your checklist, be willing to date someone who's not your type. It is very possible that the person you end up with, the person who makes it you happiest long-term is not the person you thought you would be with. Mm. That being said, in my book, I offer this exercise called the post-date eight. The post-date eight is based on research on gratitude journals. So there's amazing research from many people, including Sean Acor of Harvard, that says if at the end of the day you have to write down three things that you're grateful for, your brain will actually be looking for them throughout the day. So if you're running to make the bus and you make it, maybe five minutes later, you forget about it. But if you know that at that night you have to write it down, then you're going to notice it more. So what we do at the end impacts what we look for throughout. So the post date eight is the same idea. I've taken what I believe and what the research shows matters for evaluating a date. I've turned it into these list of eight questions. Things like, how did I feel in my body around this person? Do I feel curious about this person? What side of me did this person bring out? And then throughout the date, you aren't looking at their height and their job. You're paying attention to those things. And at the end of the date, you ask yourself the post date eight to decide, do I want to see this person again. And so it is a version of a checklist, but it's a checklist designed to help you focus on what matters, not what doesn't. Nice. And uh, I wonder if you can give some examples of like, what what are some of the questions in the post date eight? Sure. So from all the research that I've done and even the coaching I've done since my book has come out, this one of what side of me did this person bring out is huge because it helps you understand great on paper, brings out a bad side of me. I don't want to see them again. That's a really helpful insight. Another one is this idea of do they energize me or de-energize me? So there's an activity called a penthouse and a basement person. You think in your life, not even in a romantic setting, who is my penthouse person? Who, when I'm with them, do they bring my energy up? Do I feel creative? Do I feel inspired? So for you, who's your penthouse person? Who's my penthouse person? Uh, I can think of a few university friends. I think my brother is one of my penthouse people, which is why we kind of decided to start a podcast together. Um... My current housemate is a penthouse person, definitely. (laughs) I love that. Yeah. So you have this penthouse person. That's another helpful benchmark. Mm. And you have a basement person, somebody who makes you feel depressed, down, de-energized. And so just asking this question, did I feel more energized or less energized after the date, helps you understand where that person falls and helps you get closer to finding a penthouse person. Because of course, the person you end up with in a romantic relationship, you want them to bring out that inspired, capable, creative part of you. Mm. And so it's really helping you understand what stuff matters, what stuff to pay attention to, and it ignores things like, did I think they have an impressive job? And do we have enough hobbies in common, stuff that people think matters but really doesn't? Nice. Um, uh, one of the things that you talk about in the book is to always go on the second date. Uh, what's the what's deal with that? <laughs> yes. So... There's a whole idea in behavioral science of defaults. And so whatever we create as a default sticks with us. So if a hamburger place has fries as the default, most people will stick with that and get the fries. If a hamburger place has a salad as a default, most people will stick with that. In general, we stick with what the default is and these rules of thumbs. The next thing is that in dating, I think we put too much pressure on the first date. Some of the best people I know do not perform well on first dates. They are awkward. They are not comfortable. They are not good at small talk. They are more introverted. This is harder for them. But these are people who would make great long-term partners. And so how can we actually take the pressure off the first date and say, first dates are almost a warm-up round. It's Uh, do I like the sound of your voice? Am I attracted to you? Do we have something to talk about? And I'm going to assume that we're going to go on the second date pending that nothing 
crazy or terrible or unsafe happens on the first date. And that way, if you go in assuming you'll go on the second date, you're giving people more of a shot and it's easier to find those diamond in a rough people who get better over time. And one of the things I talk about throughout the book is this idea of fuck the spark, go after the slow burn. The spark is somebody who gives you instant chemistry. They make you feel so attracted to them, like you've known them for a million years. But honestly, a lot of sparky people are charismatic, but also narcissistic. They're focused on getting you to fall for them, but they're not actually asking themselves if they like you. Mm. The spark is something that you can chase that burns, that burns out quickly. Instead, you want to find this slow burn, someone who you like more and more over time, your appreciation for them grows. And those are really the people to go after. And so some of my friends who are in the best relationships that I admire, they had terrible first dates, but either because I told them to go on a second date or their mom told them to go on a second date, they gave that person more of a chance. And so you will find some great people if you make the second date the default. Let's say someone's listening to this or watching this and they're thinking, oh, damn, you know, I'm, I've definitely got some of the, one or more of those in my relationship. What are the actions that someone can take if they recognize that their relationship is sort of falling into one of these four horsemen? Well, one of the best things uh, that you can do, um, we call processing a regrettable incident. Now, here's what that means. Um, this is a particular intervention. When you've had a really bad fight where some of those four horsemen have thundered through the conversation, um, it's really important to go back with your partner and talk about what happened in the, in the way that you communicated, what went wrong in the way you communicated, and then apologize for it. And we have a five-step process for this, where each person names their feelings that they had during the regrettable incident. Then they narrate their point of view about what transpired. And needless to say, there's always two points of view. And they could feel like they're on opposite planets, but they're both valid. They're both right. So each one presents their point of view. The other one summarizes what they just heard the partner say and gives a few words of validation. Like, I get it. I can see how you would have felt that way. And then third, they talk about what may have gotten triggered for them. And triggers mean feelings that come up for you during a fight or regrettable incident that are the same feelings you may have had long before this relationship that may have started in childhood or in a former relationship. <clears throat> and those in, can include things like abandonment, rejection, feeling judged, um, feeling frightened, those kinds of old feelings you've been carrying inside you your whole life, perhaps. So you talk about those triggers and what stories go with those from your past. You share one of those. So your partner really understands better the scars that you carry inside from old experiences uh, and can try to avoid triggering those. And then the fifth step is to talk about one thing you can do differently and one thing your partner can do differently to avoid something like this from happening again. That's how you process a regrettable incident. How, how long afterwards should you, would you recommend waiting to process a regrettable incident? Are we talking like the same day or like in a, a, a couple of days from now, like what, what sort of time period are we thinking? Well, it can be um, whenever, as long as it's not immediately afterwards. So some people won't know they're supposed to do this and then they'll go back and process something 20 years later, 15 years later. The way that you know you need to process it is that it still festers in your mind when you think about it. You know, you can still feel <clears throat> the awful feelings of that event. That means you need to process it. But with that said, you have to be very calm right. when you sit down and process. And I like to tell people, imagine that you're in the upper balcony of a theater after act one of a play. That play down on stage was the two of you fighting. 
and you're talking to your partner about what happened during Act 1. That's the kind of calmness you need to have before you talk. Nice. Is there, a, a, to what extent is there utility in talking things out at the time? Um, like, you know, we've just had a, had a, had an argument. I'm kind of upset. She's kind of upset. The, do we just like continue for the rest of the day as if, all right, cool, let's park this and then carry on with our day. Do we kind of get time apart? Like how, how do we deal with it? Like, th let's say that evening or, or that day before we are both in that state of calm to be able to discuss it maybe tomorrow or the day after. Uh, okay. So can you talk about it immediately afterwards? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. It's not. Yeah, I guess. Like, what do you what do you do while the while while the emotions are still like still they're not quite at that calm level where you can discuss it fully calmly? I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it because it's so easy to slide into the old argument again. You'll slide yeah. right back into the fight. Um, and also, a lot of people will apologize almost immediately, and that doesn't work either. And the reason is because. You haven't heard your partner's experience of the fight enough to know how your behavior impacted them. Mm -hmm. So you don't really know what you're apologizing for until you've heard mm -hmm. the story of your partner's experience and you've been able to share yours too. Because usually both people in some way are responsible for what happened. Not always, but often. Oh, nice. That's great. Um, Already got a very actionable point I'm going to take away from this conversation, so thank you. By the way, in case you haven't heard, my brand new book, Feel Good Productivity, is now out. It is available everywhere books are sold, and it's actually hit the New York Times and also the Sunday Times bestseller list. So thank you to everyone who's already got a copy of the book. If you've read the book already, I would love a review on Amazon. And if you haven't yet checked it out, you may like to check it out. It's available in physical format and also ebook and also audiobook everywhere books are sold. What are some high ROI things that sort of like communication wise or anything that you can do in in a couple that would potentially help mitigate against some of the issues that people have kind of regarding communication and things like that i don't know if, if that question makes it made sense oh uh, yeah, I, yeah i think i know what you're getting at yeah. so i think like understanding that like you're not going to be perfect at communication and like fumbling your way through bad communication, mm. I think is better than like not communicating at all. But there's like lots of little things that you can do to make kind of like saying the more difficult things easier. And, I, and I've learned the hard way that if you don't bring these things up, they will just simmer and they will become resentment and anger. And then they are just going to come out completely in an uncontrolled way. Yeah. Um, and what you want is to be able to like, say these things in a very controlled scenario so you can actually have a, like a productive conversation about these things. But like, for instance, if being in the same room is really difficult when having that conversation, like I don't, I don't necessarily believe in like the hierarchy of like communication, like, like face to face is best. I'm like, if you, if you're really struggling to say that thing face to face, then maybe write it down or text them or like a phone call or something like, mm as long as like that message is getting across. I think if you are having no face-to-face -face interaction in your relationship, then work on that because there is a lot that you can gather in, from those uh, interactions. Um, but like <clears throat> things that I love doing is like if you're going for a walk together, you can always, I always find like you can have like quite deep conversations when you're going for a walk mm. because you're not, looking at each other yeah. you're like you're like looking ahead anything that kind of like gives you something else to focus on as well sometimes uh if you're like sitting together but like back to back mm. and talking is really nice because you have that contact point between you so there's that closeness and that physicality there but you're just talking at a wall mm. and for some people that can be like a lot easier to then like say some of the harder things um but you you have that comfort of like still being able to like feel their presence um, there. And then I think like just one of my favorite things in terms of communication relationships is like relationship audits and check-ins, <laughs> um, which I think was maybe what you were getting at. And I, I love these because I, I just think they're so important. Like if it's something that you do like once a year 
where you you um, make it like a fun thing. You make it like a date night, mm. right? So it feels, it doesn't feel threatening. Mm. It doesn't feel like something that you have to be worried about in the lead up to. It's actually something that you're like, looking forward to because yeah. it's like oh we're gonna go to this fancy place for dinner and then we're gonna do our relationship audit yeah. or like we're gonna go um to this gig and then like go to our favorite pub and do our relationship do you know what i mean like yeah like it it doesn't have to be a like right laptops out let's sit at the t the kitchen table yeah. and like <sighs> like if that, you yeah. if you make a like whatever works for you hmm. in terms of like what puts you in a open calm relaxed mm. mood because you don't want to be doing your relationship audit when you're like on edge right yeah. you want to like you want to be setting yourself up for success in terms of like the context that you create mm. and the environment that you're in um yeah and like asking each other like so how's the last year been <laughs> for you um like what were your highlights in terms of the relationship yeah. what were your low lights is there anything that you're interested in working on next year for us together or for me or for you as an individual, like getting all of that out there. And like, you know, if you've had like a good evening, if you've had like a lovely time together, then that uh, kind of interaction can like, can be really playful mm. and can be really like lovely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's something that me and, and my girlfriend do. Um, on a sort of every every three weeks or so, like there's yeah. a, a bit of a relationship review. We have like a notion template, which is convenient because you can just look at it on the phone and be like, all right, should we do our relationship Love it. reviews? There's like 12 <laughs> questions that we just kind of go go through. What and, kind of questions do you ask? Oh, I'll uh, give you a sample. Where's my phone go? Let's go. Let's go. Maybe I'll you can review these questions. Maybe I'll steal some of them. No, mine and Dan's last relationship audit was like, I don't know, maybe like a walk on New Year's Day, just being like, How's it been for you? Yep, good. Any notes? <laughs> nice, like, any notes. Any That's notes? a good one. <laughs> um, um, no, we've not done like a proper serious one with actual like listed out questions. I think, I, I think because we're like just naturally talking about our relationship a lot because yeah. we're about to become parents. Yeah. It just like... It just comes up quite a yeah, lot. Yeah, it comes up quite a lot in terms of just like thinking about our dynamic and mm. just being like, what... You know, I don't, yeah, just yeah, with all of it. Yeah. Like, especially because, you know, it's the last few months of it just being us two as well. Yeah. So you're like, how's it going? Yeah. And like, how do you want it to go? And like, <laughs> yeah, because I, I guess those sorts of conversations like often don't happen by default. Yeah. Like, it's so easy to get kind of caught up in the day to day. Mm -hmm. And especially like in the early stages, stages of dating someone or in a relationship where maybe you aren't living together and you're seeing each other once or twice a week and mm -hmm. you're doing something each time and there's stuff happening. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. when's the time to reflect on it? Mm. Yeah. Hey, when we did that last week, like I had a really good time and this is how this thing that you said made me feel and yeah. I really liked that. And I was just wondering like if you also had a good time, yeah. you know? <laughs> it's like, those, it's, it's unusual to have those sorts of conversations mm -hmm. like, in the moment. And so making time for them, I think makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing that we do like, oh, what went well in our relationship this week? How well supported by me did you feel this week? Mm. What's something I did that made you feel loved, appreciated or respected this week? What could I do better or differently in the coming week? In the coming week? And so we'd answer the questions yeah, yeah. for each other. What are your main stresses at the moment? How can I help? What went not so well last week? Well, or last, however, however yeah. long that period was. Um, this is a good one. Is, is there anything at all I did this week that made you feel not nice, aka sad or bad or annoyed in any tiny way? How can I make yeah. it better for us? And I find and that... That's yeah, a hard one. I, I always get really good data points on this. <laughs> <laughs> data like, points. Whoa. Okay, cool. Um, Noted. <laughs> and I, th I think with a question like that, you have to be careful with how you answer it. Mm. Um, I One of the things that I always hear from like, um, like relationship therapists and stuff yeah. is like using I sentences. So like say if like we were doing that audit and you asked me that question instead of being like well you did this and you made me and you mm. you're a bad person yeah. or like you're insensitive da, 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 da. using an i sentence would be like i felt like this because yeah. of this thing that happened or like this is how you know, like making it actually about yeah. like how um what that experience was like for you is how yeah. I've heard that it's better to no, definitely. better to do because I think kind of becoming with the like accusatory 
way like you this you that the other person can get quite defensive and actually like sometimes we do need to like own our feelings as well of like oh I felt like this and like I think that's partly due to this thing that you did but then also it might have something to do with like this thing that happened to me Mm. in my past um and maybe like it it would be really helpful for me if we talked about that more do you know what I mean like yeah rather than being like you don't understand me <laughs> yeah I've been I've been reading a book recently called uh non-violent <laughs> communication Ooh. which is all about this kind of like here is how we express our feelings in this kind of way mm-hmm. and it's all about kind of making making it about yourself that you yeah know, yeah I feel like x when this happens yeah. And then it, it it becomes not a it's it's not an accusation it's literally just this is, this is the way I'm feeling yeah and I'm just letting you know and you know I'd like us to talk about it if that's all right with you kind of vibes and then yeah there's no right or wrong answer it's not like pointing the finger at someone it's really kind of owning the feeling um, yeah because yeah. sometimes it can feel like somebody's direct actions have like hurt us in a certain way right mm. but other times like I know that there's been times where like. Dan has done something perfectly reasonable, mm. but I'm upset by it, right? Yeah. And so it's about like, sometimes it's about still being honest about that. Yeah. Like, cause sometimes we can be like, oh, my, my problems are insignificant. Like I'm not gonna bring it up. But actually like just being like that, like I felt like this, like <laughs> this is how mm. that made me feel. Whilst also acknowledging that like, maybe it wasn't entirely down to the other person's behavior Mm -hmm. because there's like there's a lot of things at play when it comes to like how we react to things and how we feel about things and some of that will be like the literal behavior that we are on the receiving end of but other times it can just be like all sorts of baggage that we're also bringing to the to the situation but being able to have those conversations about like what you do about that because even so even if someone's behavior is like perfectly reasonable like whatever you decide reasonable in your relationship is they might go okay like yes this this thing that i was doing like i know that that was reasonable but i see that it's upsetting you and so i'm happy to like meet you where you're at Mm. or maybe we meet somewhere in the middle for the time being whilst we work on this and that doesn't necessarily have to be a permanent thing like maybe that person will eventually be able to like go back to doing that thing whatever it was before yeah yeah, because I guess if you if you if you care about how the other person is feeling and like the relationship itself, yeah, yeah, that's probably more important than oh well. In my view, it's reasonable for me to do this kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, because it's like, not about being yeah. like right or wrong in mm. that situation. Like, well, it was perfectly reasonable my actions. Yeah. So I take zero responsibility for how you're feeling right now. Yeah. You know, you know, you're their teammate. You're their partner. Like, just because what you know, just because what you did was reasonable or whatever, yeah. um, doesn't mean that you can just completely take a step back from your partner's feelings. Mm. And that's why I like that question about like, what's making you feel stressed right now and how can I help? Mm. Because that stress um, wasn't caused by you, but you're still making it part of your responsibility as their partner to help them with that. One of the things I used to have on my Hinge profile was the the prompt was um, the ideal relationship is when dot, dot, dot. And I, I wrote something like when we spend 10% of our time each day together and the rest of the time kind of doing our own thing. And I had some, that, that, that was a very controversial thing to say. I had some people being like, I mean, 10% of 24 hours, 2.4 hours, I mean, sounds reasonable, possibly, <laughs> possibly a bit excessive. And I had other people being like, oh my God, what a fucking sociopath, psychopath. I, how, how, how dare he suggest you want to be in a relationship where you're only spending 10% of your time like together. In my mind, I was thinking like two and a half hours a day is a long time to spend like <laughs> with someone quality time. Like surely you want to like kind of do your own thing and read your own book and not feel the need to have all this time kind of together together. Um, what's your take on kind of in, a, in the context of a relationship, this balance between hanging out versus not hanging out? I think, uh, yeah, you know what? When you actually pan that down to 10% is 2.4 hours that makes sense i mean i think it's, it's really funny because you see 10 percent, you think oh that's nothing but i i think the, the crux is quality time right i like i love the idea of my, my romantic fantasy is like reading a book on the opposite end of a sofa to someone else also reading their own book you oh, know yeah like, that's great and someone who's spent but you know it's a lot it's of time dream, yeah, yeah I, but like the idea of alone togetherness that comfort that you know coming back to that donald winnicott child psychologist thing of like being comfortable in the presence of another without needing to interact. Um, I, I think that 
you know, that's maybe the gray area. That's maybe the, you know, maybe that's the 20% that we're not, of, of the waking hours that aren't being accounted for in that 10%. Yeah. There's, there, there, there is a gray area there. But quality time, I think, is, is so important because I think, uh, and people have different approaches with dating, but for some, and I think this can be driven by insecurity quite a lot. There's the sense that you should be checking in every hour or so, hour or two on WhatsApp. That's my personal hell. I, I, you know, WhatsApp, so much stuff gets misconstrued. Me and my best friend in the world, we, you know, we, yes, we'll WhatsApp. And when, honestly, we sometimes get, you know, occasionally one of us will send each other a WhatsApp late at night and we'll get into this like frenetic, great, energetic conversation. But we don't, I, you know, I, I, we do not message each other asking how was your day because yeah. we know that our bond is so great, that our energy together, our quality time is so much better than this weird green app that's pinging and, you know, in, in between our hinge notifications and our like, you know, Instagram or whatever. Like we know that it's more than that. So we don't want to reduce it. So I think, you know, I think that maybe it's an easier sell and it's, it's hard because, you know, hinge like Twitter gives you what well, in those prompts, um, text boxes, it gives you like a, a small amount of characters and you know, also no one wants to, a nuanced essay on a hinge profile anyway, but <laughs> it, you know, there, there is so yeah. much more to it. There is so much more to it. Um, and I think, you know, in the same way that we, we can make alone a time, quality time, I think it's made me so much more passionate about my friendships and my time with others being really really good like i'm i think again when it's not just like you know you're not just sort of like lazily reaching for someone to kind of just you know be with you to quell your existential fear of dying then it's really nice to you know know that you're gonna actually value that that yeah. time so yeah i don't know i think it's it i can i can totally see why it was a hard sell but i think that in a relationship <laughs> yeah it's just it's it, it's 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 just communicating that value yeah isn't it yeah, well, one thing that my my girlfriend and I kind of distinguish between is together together time and together alone time. Oh, so you have that? Yeah. So like, together alone is where we're chilling in the same on on the dining table doing our own work or right. reading our own books or like doing our own thing. And together together time is when we're actually together together doing a thing or like spending quality time with one another. And I like I like really like it when it's skewed more in the together alone camp. Yeah. Of like we're in the same room, we're enjoying each, each other's company, but we're doing our own thing. And then the time that we do spend together is like intentionally there and we're intentionally present. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I mean, honestly, I, you know, I've been in kind of a handful of shorter relationships in the time, you know, post, post alonement era the past three years, but getting it right in the relationship, I think it's absolutely magic. Cause I think quite often people think about this concept in terms of being single and look, some people want to be single for life and that's a completely brilliant you know in some ways delicious life experience I, most people don't so the gold standard i suppose is getting that value into a relationship so you know well done to begin with how, how do you and how but how do you keep that balance going so that can be a difficult one right if you i know, I know you're probably yeah. not as cutthroat as the 10 percent these days but yeah i mean so we don't live together so that makes it fairly, fairly straightforward um often if we are on holiday we will kind of plan out like okay today we're gonna have like the morning after breakfast we're gonna do co-working until 3 p.m which basically means <laughs> sitting on our respective laptops doing our own thing and then we'll go on this like th thing we'll, we'll go out for dinner we'll go on this cruise we'll, like whatever um and so having those like co-working blocks is like there's basically that together alone time um once we start living together at some point maybe post-marriage uh then i'm sure it'll become a trickier balance where you are in each other's company all the time mm -hmm. i guess yeah. yeah, I think that that is, I yeah, it's because it's been so long that I don't, I can't quite imagine what that like incidental time with a partner would be. Um, I don't know, but I guess it's it's just going in with the values, and I think that that is, it's 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 almost why it's important to have these like these harder conversations early on, I suppose, because then you're going, then you're at least you know it it, it almost happens more naturally because you're like okay, well, okay. It's it's go like we alone time is a value, therefore it will come yeah. at some point during today or 
All right, so that's it for this week's episode of Deep Dive. Thank you so much for watching or listening. All the links and resources that we mentioned in the podcast are going to be linked down in the video description or in the show notes, depending on where you're watching or listening to this. If you're listening to this on a podcast platform, then do please leave us a review on the iTunes store. It really helps other people discover the podcast. Or if you're watching this in full HD or 4K on YouTube, then you can leave a comment down below and ask any questions or any insights or any thoughts about the episode. That would be awesome. And if you enjoyed this episode, you might like to check out this episode here as well, which links in with some of the stuff that we talked about in the episode. So thanks for watching. Uh, do hit the subscribe button if you aren't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.